Since this is our first time hearing Artsakh updates from Professor Asturian, I will briefly introduce him with a very abbreviated bio. Dr. Asturian is the William Saroyan Director of the Armenian Studies Program at the University of California, Berkeley. He is also an Associate Adjunct Professor in Armenian and Caucasian History in its Department of History. He is the co-editor with Dr. Raymond Kevorkian of a soon to be published volume entitled Collective and State Violence in Turkey, the Construction of a National Identity from Empire to Nation State out this month on Berghan Press and the author of a forthcoming volume entitled At the Crossroads of the Armenian Azerbaijani Conflict, History, Territory, Nationalisms out in the next year with Mazda Publishers. Thank you, Professor Asturian for updating us tonight. So the plan for tonight is we're going to have a Q&A with Professor Asturian, and we'll start with the first question for tonight. A humanitarian ceasefire was supposed to begin at midnight on Saturday, local time. Can you tell us what has happened since then? Uh, uh, the answer is extremely simple. Uh, Azerbaijan uh, was not interested in it at all. Uh, they agreed to it in Moscow and then uh, they changed positions. Uh, there are indications that they took advantage of uh, that agreement uh, to regroup uh, troops. Uh, and this was the second time that uh, the ceasefire agreements uh, have failed. Uh, so it's very straightforward answer. The war has continued with, uh, I would say, even uh, renewed intensity, especially in the south, uh, with uh, positions that have uh, changed. So it seems like, the, yes, the ceasefire was not respected. It was immediately broken again. So I would, we would like to hear about whether either side has made significant gains this week, any military gains. And though we also are never sure about Azerbaijan's military casualties, because it does not release that kind of information, it does not release its military casualties. Can you tell us about the major losses this week? Well, on the Armenian side, uh, it's clear that there is an average of uh, 40 to 90 uh, soldiers uh, killed every day. It varies every day, uh, you, you know. Uh, that's most of the time. There might be a few more some days, uh, but that's the range approximately. Uh, that means also there are at least uh, twice that number uh, of people probably who are wounded. Uh, we don't know that. On the Azerbaijani side, it's difficult to tell since they are hiding uh, the data. Uh, on the basis of Armenian uh, estimates of Azerbaijani losses, they are now close to uh, 6,500 soldiers uh, killed. They are not too far from that number, uh, which suggests also a lot of uh, soldiers who have been uh, wounded. Uh, on the Armenian side, the official data is uh, now exceeding, uh, I believe, uh, or very close to uh, 700 uh, soldiers killed. Uh, I, don't, I, I saw a uh, uh, figure yesterday, I don't remember it exactly, but by saying 700, I think we are very close to that accurate number. Now, those are about the losses. Are, were there any significant military gains that were made on either side uh, this in the last week or so? Or were there any significant um, offensives that were made on either side, if, that you, if you could comment on that? I will uh, comment on this in a somewhat abstract way for various uh, reasons that uh, I will also uh, state. You cannot judge a war uh, or how it is going on the basis of uh, daily fluctuations uh, of positions, uh, even weekly. Keep in mind that uh, if you looked at the Second World War, uh, you know, the German offensive against the Soviet Union, uh, it went beautifully well 
uh, for the first few months. Uh, then they were stuck uh, with massive losses, uh, whole army corps uh, surrounded. Then they returned uh, to Berlin with the Russians advancing, you know, up to that city. So I noticed in the Armenian press in Armenia, among some Armenian opposition figures, attempts at uh, creating fear uh, that the situation is extremely bad, I am concerned, uh, and so on. There is that rhetoric uh, which would be, uh, wouldn't be tolerated even one day uh, in France if France uh, were in a, in a war. Uh, uh, that has proliferated over the past few days, and I regret that. Uh, and uh, on the other hand, who cares whether you are worried, you are happy, or uh, whatever else you might be. That is, uh, uh, assuming people are genuine and are not pursuing a, a political agenda. Uh, personally, I'm not par particularly interested whether uh, they are happy or uh, concerned or distraught or depressed. You know, I don't see what is to be gained by saying those things. Yes, there have been significant uh, uh, changes this week and also counter, uh, uh, massive counter changes. Uh, the main idea, the global idea is uh, one has to keep the following issue uh, in mind. Uh, the evolution, the changes seem to be occurring in the southern front. The, keep in mind the northern front is uh, mountainous with places uh, above even, I believe, 3,000 meter high. Uh, there hasn't been so far as I know, I am, I mean, I am not part of the army, uh, any uh, major uh, changes there so far as I know. In the south is a uh, more uh, flat terrain uh, for uh, part of it. And it would seem that there have been some advances by Azerbaijani troops uh, and that Armenian forces uh, might have tactically withdrawn to higher positions. And yesterday they uh, really wiped out uh, Azerbaijani forces uh, that thought that they had uh, control of the uh, Hodaferin bridge and uh, dam. Uh, so this is uh, the situation. And um, I repeat, there is no point in uh, thinking that from afar and by describing what happens this day, that day, over the past three days, you get a better understanding of the war. Uh, the Armenian officer corps is outstanding. <clears throat> And uh, they know how to trap enemy forces, for example. And if they have withdrawn, that doesn't mean automatically that it's a disaster and uh, things are falling apart. Now, all of this having been said, uh, I cannot predict how the war is going to develop uh, over the next week or several weeks. We don't know how long it will last. But again, in a war, uh, it ain't done until it's done. And uh, it's uh, the end of it that is important. At that point, we can assess what's going on. Yeah, I, I completely understand what you mean there about winning a battle is not does not mean winning a war, or, win, or losing a battle does not mean losing a war. So we have to look at this more holistically and also see at the end of the, I, I hope ha at the end of uh, this conflict, at the end of this war, we'll see what what has been gained uh in any case why don't we go on to a different topic so you did mention the southern um region as being a, a now it a more active area of of the fight now let's go on to a different area um we know that the foreign ministers of armenia and azerbaijan will be in washington on friday to meet with secretary of state mike pompeo mm -hmm. Besides the broken ceasefire, can you share your thoughts on the recent diplomatic efforts? Well, uh, I assume the question uh, pertains uh, to, to, to the United States, uh, since you mentioned that visit. Uh, over the first uh, two weeks or more of the conflict, uh, uh, 
the United States was essentially uh, non-existent, I would say. Uh, there, there is no uh, particular significant comment about what was going on, uh, except perhaps some official, uh, you, you know, uh, the, the conflict uh, cannot be solved militarily. You know, that type of comment that is uh, uh, the, uh, the, that they repeat endlessly. And in addition, it is not true. The conflict can be solved militarily if one of the two sides uh, is uh, either fully defeated or uh, on its way to defeat. So it's a literally an absurdity that a conflict cannot be solved militarily and this and that. Uh, insofar as the United States, as I said, the first two weeks or a, a few more days, uh, you know, uh, quasi absence. Uh, then Secretary Pompeo had uh, two statements, I think, uh, encouraging, I believe, ceasefire. And then some nice thing, he hopes that uh, uh, Armenians uh, will keep fighting uh, uh, and uh, successfully. So I don't, he's not a diplomat by training, but uh, for sure he must know what he's saying. So in uh, Secretary Pompeo's uh, statements, uh, one can discern that uh, the United States has uh, more or less stated that Azerbaijan started the conflict and that uh, the Armenians are defending themselves. Now in itself, that's already significant because you know when you read things like uh, the bbc or uh, other uh, country statements uh, sometimes those countries don't know uh, how how things are happening now what will be achieved on uh, friday uh, i don't know uh, you know france and russia tried to uh, establish a ceasefire it was immediately breached uh, the Minsk group co-chairs breached. Uh, I don't know exactly what uh, Secretary Pompeo's goals are. Will it be uh, again a ceasefire? Uh, will it be something broader? Uh, you know, uh, one thing is certain: without massive pressure from the U.S., uh, Turkey would like this conflict to go on. Uh, and I am not quite sure uh, that the United States uh, will adopt such a position uh, toward uh, Turkey. Uh, so that, uh, I think, uh, it takes care of the problem. Uh, and I hope I replied to your question. You did. So uh, you, you told us much about the American diplomatic efforts. And as you mentioned, the statements recently by Pompeo um, might suggest that the Americans have supported the, the claim by Armenia and nagorno karabakh that and Artsakh that Azerbaijan started this war. So that's great. Um, it is a step forward in some ways. However, we don't know how what will happen on Friday. Uh, so I have another question, sort of a follow up to that. How are Russia, Turkey and Iran reacting this week? I know and that this might be a longer uh, response and uh, feel free to respond however you wish. You might, you know, if you want to respond for Russia, Turkey or Iran first, whichever you prefer. Uh, let's start with the, uh, the one that is uh, the, the, the clearest and simplest uh, answer, you know. Uh, let's start with Turkey. Uh, Turkey has adopted a maximalist attitude, which is not surprising. And I believe this morning or yesterday night, I saw that this morning, uh, uh, President Erdogan has even said that if, uh, if need be, uh, if Azerbaijan uh, requests, uh, Turkey is ready to send troops to Azerbaijan to back up the Azerbaijani war effort. So I think just that statement gives you an idea of the whole thing. And of course, along the way, it's as if uh, they didn't have already troops there. Uh, it is estimated that there are 600 or 650 uh, military, uh, uh, Turkish uh, military elements of various types 
uh, from generals to special forces to uh, people uh, dealing with drones and so on in uh, Azerbaijan already today. So they have already troops there. Uh, so Turkey, it's absolutely clear. Uh, uh, the more complicated answers are uh, the other two. Uh, uh, let's go to Iran nearby. Uh, Iran's position officially is a position of uh, net almost neutrality. You know, uh, they don't want conflict uh, there. Uh, they will back ceasefire and so. But in practical terms, uh, Iran is not at all happy that uh, Islamist terrorists have been inserted into the region. Iran is not at all happy that the Southern Front is essentially a war along the Arax River, uh, the Arax River Valley. And keep in mind that that river is the boundary uh, with Iran. So the other side is Iran. And on the other side, on the, the Iranian side, uh, going towards Tabriz and right and left in Iran, uh, you have uh, Iranian Azeris, that is the real, the people who have been called historically Azerbaijan and uh, are the Iranian Azeris. Historically, Azerbaijan was uh, the Iranian part, uh, in that region exactly. Uh, Tabriz and, and the surroundings. Uh, there is some agitation among those uh, um, Azeri Turks of uh, I Iran, uh, which was actually uh, the, the hope of the West, of the US, of uh, uh, Israel, and so on. Uh, uh, let's call her scholar, uh, but uh, it's, she's more than a scholar, Brenda Schaffer. Uh, published a book, I believe it's more than a decade ago now, uh, precisely on uh, these people and their uh, vast hopes that, uh, you know, they would create a headache for Iran. Now I believe she is in Israel. Uh, uh, she has contacts with various bodies. At some point, uh, there was a center at Harvard. Uh, I don't remember what it was called, the Caspian Center or something like that. Uh, uh, she was the executive director of it, I believe. So there has been a long uh, standing agenda, you know, uh, uh, of uh, uh, creating problems in Iran from within. And the largest group that looked the most promising were the Iranian Azeris. Now, uh, Iran has also made it clear that if more missiles or anything else, uh, drones, appear on its territory, uh, there would be a price to be paid for that. Uh, that is clearly uh, a warning uh, to Azerbaijan uh, because most of uh, those uh, cases, there have been several, come from Azerbaijan. Uh, the uh, Iranian, uh, there was a meeting with the Iranian military attaché uh, in, uh, I believe, in Yerevan, just a few days ago, uh, probably two days ago it was, uh, during which the Armenian side explained to him that, of course, they have no interest at all in uh, shelling anything in Iran, but that Azerbaijan is precisely using that, uh, you see, by advancing along uh, the, uh, the Arax River, they have their left side. I mean, from their perspective, their left side is totally secure because it's an Iranian border. So they cannot be fully uh, uh, surrounded on all parts. And one side is totally secure. Uh, so uh, uh, the Armenian side explained that, uh, you know, if uh, Azerbaijan uh, uses that and really endangers Armenian forces, they will be forced to retaliate and of course uh, their goal is certainly not to uh, damage anything in Iran but they also need to protect uh, themselves. Indirectly uh, Iran might be the conduit for uh, uh, the transfer of various things to Armenia. Keep in mind that 
uh, Georgia has uh, generously closed its airspace uh, supposedly to all sides, uh, but that is a lie. It is allowing uh, pseudo civilian planes to go to Baku every day from Turkey. And uh, uh, you can rest assured they are not carrying tourists, you know, uh, right now. Uh, so uh, Georgia is doing what it has always done without thinking that in the long term, if Armenia is in trouble, it will be a puppet of Turkey and Azerbaijan. And in some regions, actually, there is a vast Turkish presence now in Georgia. Uh, so it might be a crafty policy in the short run because they have their, uh, the Azerbaijani pipelines, you know, reaching the ports through Georgia. In the long run, it might uh, turn out to be a little bit problematic uh, for them. In so far as Russia is concerned, again, the situation is extremely complex. Russia has uh, a lot of problems uh, to face. Uh, instability in Kyrgyzstan, instability in Belarus, the problem of the annexation of Crimea, uh, the semi-dormant uh, conflict uh, in the eastern uh, Ukraine. Uh, there is Syria, where it is involved. There is Libya. In both Syria and Libya, Turkey is on the other side of the uh, spectrum of the conflict. Uh, so uh, I, I am absolutely certain Russia is not at all enthusiastic about this conflict. It is even less enthusiastic to see that uh, already thousands of Islamists have been uh, imported, so to say, uh, into Azerbaijan, and from there they can cross very easily into the North Caucasus, and that's the weak part uh, of the Russian South. Uh, these are very unstable uh, 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 republics. Uh, Chechnya held by a strong man, Ingushetia, Dagestan with a collection of uh, minorities and other such areas. So it views that as a big no-no, uh, the second thing where uh, it has made a clear statement, uh, just a few days ago, four or five days ago, uh, they put out a statement to the effect that they are verifying whether Azerbaijan has uh, uh, fired, uh, shelled, uh, bombed uh, Armenian territory itself. So I believe Russia, when push came to shove, uh, will use those two arguments, uh, insertion of terrorists and attack uh, against the Armenian territory to uh, openly uh, uh, do something, uh, the extent of which I don't know, full intervention, uh, a few warning shots, to put it metaphorically. Uh, uh, but uh, at that point, it will uh, intervene in one way or another. Uh, and also, in order for, for it to intervene, of course, the Armenian government has to request that. And uh, up to now, at no point, so far as I know, has the Armenian government asked for uh, Russian involvement. Uh, they are waiting, uh, you know, they, they will ask if really uh, need be. Uh, on the other hand, Russia has a, a, a very old agenda already, several years old. That is, they want to establish peacekeepers, so-called peacekeepers, uh, around Karabakh uh, to stabilize, supposedly, the situation. Uh, the Armenian side has been opposed to that because it's de facto loss of sovereignty. Uh, and uh, once they are there, uh, you, you know, they are there. Uh, you, you can, it's a bit difficult to tell them to leave. Uh, as for Azerbaijan, now it is even more emboldened. I read the Azerbaijani press in Azerbaijani every morning. Uh, the, you know, there is a, a feeling of uh, major achievements and so on. Uh, all the casualties are you know, uh, taboo, there is nothing about that. Uh, everything is going well. Uh, you, you see short videos of soldiers raising a flag and so on. Uh, 
so there is some kind of a euphoria uh, which uh, if things go poorly later on for Azerbaijan, uh, uh, that will be very counterproductive because uh, the, the population, except perhaps a few uh, educated people or others, uh, are not at all uh, aware of the extent of the losses. You know, uh, there are uh, probably indications uh, that uh, Armenia might be receiving some uh, help. Uh, I won't specify uh, of what type. Uh, uh, and uh, um, so this is basically the position of Russia. Uh, there have been uh, months ago before the war, supposedly in the Armenian press in Armenia, supposedly the Russians want war and this and that. Uh, these are totally typically uh, the type of paranoid distorted articles that you can find uh, in that uh, press. I don't believe one minute that uh, Russia is excited and happy at uh, what's uh, going on. All the more so, the more so since if things degenerate and uh, Mr. Erdogan is uh, continues to be that self-confident about intervening and so on. Uh, uh, you, you know, the, what is a war? Uh, uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan could literally degenerate into uh, a larger uh, conflict. Uh, so uh, there are many things that cannot be predicted, but are far from impossible. So, so from what I heard in your response here with Russia, Turkey, and Iran, um, we know Turkey's stance of officially helping Azerbaijan and, and saying we will send more troops. Um, and Russia and Iran both watching the situation. Uh, Iran with the southern border very uh, much watching the, so the south and to see what's happening there. But Russia, as you mentioned, um, checking things just to make sure that uh, Armenia was in fact attacked, because if so, they could, uh, they would have to, uh, if asked by Armenia, come to their aid. So yeah, this you know, uh, let's keep in mind that uh, Russia has a treaty with Armenia. Mm -hmm. uh, in that treaty, uh, the issue of Karabakh is not included uh, because I hear a lot of Armenians. You know, why is Russia not doing, uh, you know, uh, supporting, intervening, and so on? Uh, they are allies. You know, well, where are they? Uh, this is an irrelevant issue. You know, uh, the treaty is not with mountainous Karabakh, with the Republic of Artsakh, which by the way is uh, unrecognized uh, up to now. Eh? Uh, no, no. So uh, uh, that argument is very simplistic. And uh, I believe yesterday, I read it this morning, gave a length lengthy uh, speech, uh, the prime minister Pashinyan, uh, in which he's uh, lauding Russia and uh, stating that uh, 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 contrary to what some circles uh, uh, related to the previous authorities in Armenia have been claiming over the past two years, you know, that uh, uh, the situation for Armenia is very dangerous because the Russian elite hates Pashinyan, uh, things are falling apart and so on. But, you know, Mr. Kocharyan, Mr. Ser Sarkisian, oh, they were beloved in Moscow, you know, they were cherished. Uh, uh, Mr. Pashinyan is clearly stating that he is extremely happy with very solid interactions with uh, the Kremlin, and uh, I happen uh, to believe him. Uh, I believe at first the Russians were concerned when he became prime minister and the Velvet Revolution and some ideas that are uh, more Western ideas about rights, these and that. Uh, but uh, my impression is that after that first year and maybe a few more months, uh, they have come to the conclusion that me, despite those, uh, uh, you know, mental changes, changes in mentality or uh, laws and so on, that uh, Mr. Pashinyan is wise enough uh, not to do what people, uh, what people like uh, Saakashvili in Georgia uh, 
uh, thought they could do that, uh, you know, uh, Armenia is going to join NATO, Georgia is going to join NATO and so on. Uh, I believe, uh, the, you know, the people who, uh, who know in Russia and have power have uh, realized that uh, this gentleman, Mr. Pashinyan, is not going to take that route. Uh, and thus, I believe uh, that uh, they have more confidence when they are dealing uh, with him. Uh, I am also uh, confident that uh, some help has been provided uh, by uh, Russia. Uh, the details of which uh, uh, are not for this uh, uh, program. Uh, but what I wanted to say, it is also wrong to assume that uh, Russia is just uh, watching and, uh, you know, the, they are sitting around Nargiles and uh, vodkas and uh, doing um, nothing. <laughs> so that's reassuring. I, I, I personally feel reassured by hearing that. Now, how uh, would you, so we were talking a little bit about what was happening in Armenia earlier in your response. Could you describe for us the mood in Armenia today? What is the mood like these days there? The mood, is, there is somebody who wants to Skype me because uh, I have the program, uh, you know, le, le, this morning. Uh, uh, the mood in Armenia is quite interesting. I, I, I received a very lengthy email uh, by a good friend of mine who is also uh, an academic, but not in Armenia, but he lives in Armenia now because of COVID, he can teach uh, uh, from, uh, from afar. Uh, there is massive solidarity with the war effort. Even poor people go to the front of Matenadara, and he gave me the example of a poor taxi driver, an old man. Every day he goes and he gives a pack of cigarettes, you know, that's what he can afford. Huh? Other people do other things. Uh, families have welcomed uh, Harapar Armenians, uh, you know, who were encouraged to leave at the beginning of the conflict, and wisely uh, so. You know, uh, uh, most of the civilian population now of Karabakh, uh, not all at all, but um, most uh, uh, probably um, by now, probably 100,000 people, may, maybe more, I don't know, but the figure of 80,000 was already clear uh, several days ago. Uh, you know, they are in Yerevan, uh, maybe in surrounding places, uh, I hear in hotels uh, with families, uh, and there is a, a massive uh, uh, solidarity. Uh, you have old men uh, who fought, you know, in, uh, in the 1990s, early 1990s, uh, who are now uh, 65 year old, uh, uh, even though officially uh, uh, only people up to 55, uh, you, you know, they can uh, mobilize them or they accept them. They are going if, and fighting uh, uh, to, at the front. Uh, and the argument is very simple. There is a consciousness there, very clear consciousness, that this battle, uh, this war is much more than a war uh, around the issue of Karabakh. And uh, they know it in a more uh, subjective way or um, maybe in a sentimental way. Because for me also, this is not just a war about Karabakh. The southern direction of the attack you know, goes towards Mehri and uh, uh, Zangezu, and later on, uh, uh, Nakhichevan. Uh, this conflict is part of a large scale uh, agenda, so far as I am concerned, Turkish agenda that has been adopted by the little brothers in uh, Azerbaijan, Okay, uh, and Zangezur is part of the problem. Uh, cutting Armenia from Iran is part of the plan. Uh, so, uh, you know, the, the, uh, what's going on in Armenia is quite uh, impressive, apparently, uh, according uh, to that source and somebody else who corroborated that it's remarkable uh, uh, solidarity that he can see uh, there. 
On the other hand, as I said, uh, this past week, actually, uh, some opposition circles uh, who are not even represented in parliament, okay, they don't even have one deputy in the parliament, have come up with an agenda of supposedly uh, creating a national emergency body or something like that with 16 parties. Of those 16 parties, 14 uh, are as much a party than uh, I am a political party, if I take into account my family. Some of them have barely 12 members or 25 members and so on. Uh, they, they don't even exist outside Yerevan. Uh, only two of them have significant structures throughout Armenia. And they have come up with a proclamation uh, asserting that you know, this national body and so on, supposedly bringing unity, should also have the right to take decisions. Uh, this is a remarkable phenomenon. You know, I have been studying history for many decades now. I have never seen that in any country at times of war. That is, that uh, people uh, who have no representation whatsoever in parliament, after free and fair elections, are going to claim a position of quasi-leadership with decision-making. And it will be 16 different individuals, leaders of parties, that are going to decide as if there was no defense ministry, there were no generals, or, you know, there, there is no government, apparently. Uh, they, they, these people are going to decide. From the same circles came uh, uh, statements. I won't name them. Okay, saying the situation is very bad, very, very bad. We are very concerned and so on. Uh, we tried, we tried to unite the nation, but uh, Mr. Pashinyan, you know, he doesn't agree and so on. Uh, even though Mr. Pashinyan met with them, which was actually uh, quite uh, remarkable. Uh, so there are, uh, when we say the mood in Armenia, the, uh, I, I could very clearly notice uh, the, this past week approximately, uh, uh, this attempt at uh, um, creating a fear, uh, uh, you know, a depressive mood to the effect that uh, things are going very poorly and so on. Uh, my position is very simple, you know, uh, in times of war, uh, even if those things were true, hmm, what do you gain by stating them in uh, your, your country? You gain nothing. You demoralize, you bring in fear, uh, and you weaken uh, the nation to which you belong. So uh, the other uh, side of the coin, uh, the opposite side of the coin, the massive solidarity of small people, uh, average people, uh, is this type of uh, political uh, uh, games that uh, are not going to go uh, anywhere, I believe. So from your uh, description of the mood in Armenia, it seems like so much solidarity with uh, this kind of footnote uh, about these these smaller parties, the size of families uh, who are kind of stirring some things up. Um, now, however, you did mention a few things in here that, again, reassure us here in the diaspora about what's going on there in Armenia and also in Artsakh. So thank you for sharing that information with us about what, what the mood is there, which seems like the, the mood of solidarity. Mm -hmm. So thank you for sharing that. Um, we have a few last questions and uh, then we'll wrap it up for this evening. So there was a question in our Facebook live stream. Uh, we've been getting a few questions on there and I'll, I'll share these two with you and you could pick them up as you would like. Uh, one of them is what is Russia's, um, what is Russia, how could Russia react? How might Russia react to a close Turkey Ukraine alignment? So what, how might they react if that uh, relationship was strengthened? And uh, another question unrelated is, um, will pre the president of uh, France come to our aid? Will France come to our aid? Is France uh, a player in this? Of course, as we know, um, one of the ceasefires was 
done with the aid of France. Uh, however, uh, either of these questions are, you can pick them up as you'd like um, to comment on. I mean, the, the Ukrainians have uh, very clearly chosen uh, their side in this conflict, and it's not Armenia, uh, it's Azerbaijan, uh, as a result, Turkey. Uh, one of the reasons, of course, is, uh, you know, the uh, separation of Crimea, which actually was part uh, of the Soviet Union and was not part of the uh, Ukraine. Uh, until uh, the 1950s, when Khrushchev uh, agreed to the transfer of Crimea uh, to the Soviet Socialist Republic of Ukraine. Uh, so they have that problem with Russia. They have the fact that uh, maybe one third of the country, or may maybe a little bit more, uh, the, uh, you, you know, uh, is essentially a secessionist uh, segment of the country. Uh, and Russia played a role in that. So in general, they are not exactly enthusiastic about uh, secessionist uh, uh, attempts because, uh, you know, a, a success on the part of Karabakh, of course, uh, uh, has ripple effects, you know. Uh, by the way, the same uh, issue, uh, the fact that after the disastrous attempt by uh, uh, Mr. Saakashvili to attack uh, South Ossetia and the Russians literally moved into Georgia, cut the country into two. Uh, neither uh, the late Senator McCain or uh, the Republicans, none of them who had encouraged Mr. Saakashvili budged an inch and Abkhazia proclaimed independence, South Ossetia proclaimed independence. So you see that these people view the issue of Karabakh in, a, in, under, uh, in, the, same, in the same way they view the, the issues that have weakened their countries. Hmm? Uh, how Russia might react to, uh, you know, Ukrainian, uh, uh, Turkish collaboration or, uh, you, you know, even more than that. Uh, I have no idea. It all depends on the extent, uh, uh, certainly, of that collaboration or if it reaches uh, some kind of uh, military formula or treaty or something like that. Uh, uh, then uh, things might uh, uh, get bad. Uh, but, you, you know, the, the Russian state, like uh, all major imperial states and uh, great powers, uh, uh, you know, takes uh, steps after a lot of calculations. And uh, as I am not privy of those uh, calculations, and as we cannot predict what Ukraine and Turkey are going to do in two months from now, uh, my answer is basically general. You know, it would be foolish to predict something precise uh, when you don't have uh, those data at hand. Uh, the other question was... Uh, the, other qu the other question was about France. Uh, however, we, we could also, uh, you did talk about the ceasefire, so we could also table that for next week because we will be talking... No, to I can give a, a, a very quick answer. Uh, okay. You know, there is a large community, Armenian community in France and so on. Uh, okay, they think they have a lot of influence. Uh, French policy is not determined by the fact that uh, you have uh, 500,000 uh, fully integrated model uh, refugees and immigrants who became Frenchmen and we love them. These are our Armenians. It's Charles Aznavour, uh, I don't know what Manoukian, it's such and such an artist. Uh, that's not how the French state uh, uh, works. Hmm? Uh, they have their own interests. They can make beautiful statements. They can try to be helpful. I believe President Macron uh, would like to be helpful. But what means does he have to affect Turkish policies when several European states don't want to put uh, sanctions on Turkey? In a nutshell, France is a medium power, again, one of the top 10 uh, by any chance, a medium power with nuclear, thermonuclear missiles, 
nuclear submarines, not a lot of people have that, believe me, uh, in the world nations. So it, it is a very significant power, but by itself, you know, it has very few, little leverage on uh, this conflict as various European countries, including Germany, Italy, Hungary, and so on, Spain, uh, are against any uh, sanctions against Turkey. Whether France is helping indirectly with uh, some, uh, I don't know what type, humanitarian or uh, uh, some military material that is not too big and so on, I have no idea about that, uh, but uh, overall, uh, the significance of France is that it is one of the three uh, key members of the Minsk group hmm, leading the negotiations along with Russia and the US, so it plays a very significant role there. I have heard right and left, I actually just uh, a few hours ago, I was reading an article about somebody in France telling uh, a particular website in Armenia that France might recognize Karabakh and so on. Uh, uh, I mean, if it recognizes Karabakh as one of the three co-chairs of the Minsk groups, group, that means essentially it has taken sides and it excludes itself from the Minsk group. Uh, so uh, a lot of people, uh, you know, people are talking, uh, but issues are a little bit uh, more uh, complex, I would say. Hmm? Yeah. So from what I'm hearing, what I'm hearing you say about France's involvement here is that it can't act in isolation in in the sense that if it acts in isolation uh, to choose to sanction or to choose to recognize Artsakh, uh, it's not really effective. In fact, it, it kind of shoots itself in the foot uh, with the Actually, it might even weaken the Armenian side if France is out. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know. Uh, no, but. You know, if people are predicting maybe France is going to recognize, I, I cannot deny it because it's, a, it's something that hasn't happened. It's a prediction. Hmm? Uh, maybe an airplane might also, might also fall on my house uh, on Friday evening at 6.15, you know? Uh, I cannot argue against that, you see, because uh, I don't know. It may technically, statistically, it's unlikely, but that could happen. Uh, so uh, that's why my answer tries to stay within the bounds of things that can be reasonably stated on the base of the data we have. I don't want to go into uh, uh, to rely on things I, uh, uh, you know, I, I cannot predict uh, for which we have no clear data and to, make, to reach conclusions on the base of that. Sure, I completely understand. So what sounds like a way forward, though, is a coalition of countries that are going to come together and say, OK, we sanction. We're going to ask this from Azerbaijan. Uh, that seems like a more likely way forward uh, in, from what I'm hearing you say. Well, that could be, for example, depending on the attitude adopted by the US, apparently this Karabakh problem uh, right now is probably the only issue around which uh, the, the US and Russia pretty much agree <laughs> and uh, are working together. And it's quite clear on both sides. I mean, it's not uh, the Russians saying that or, uh, you know, uh, it is quite clear. Now, if Russia, the US, plus France, you know, come up with a clearer statement that we know who is responsible for what this time, eh? instead of general statement, we want ceasefire, the problem cannot be solved militarily and so on, okay? If they point to responsibilities and uh, adopt a firmer attitude, uh, uh, th th that should give some food for thought uh, to Turkey, because behind this conflict, there is Turkey. We constantly talk about Azerbaijan, but Azerbaijan, so far as I'm concerned, has already started relinquishing uh, some of uh, its uh, authority. 
uh, you know, you don't bring uh, foreign generals to fight a war if you have, uh, 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 if you are fully sovereign. Hmm? I cannot imagine French uh, fighting a war and uh, importing Danish generals uh, and special forces uh, to tell them exactly what they have to do. Hmm? Uh, so uh, the technology they provide, the Bayraktar drones that have been very effective until two days ago, mm -hmm. uh, they have started falling lately, these last two days. Uh, so uh, uh, the issue beyond Azerbaijan that can be, you know, Azerbaijan can be uh, really, you can uh, uh, put pressure on it easily, uh, is the involvement of Turkey. That complicates things uh, very significantly. Of course, that's actually at the heart of this conflict, why this conflict has escalated so, so mm -hmm. rapidly and so quickly and so um, violently. Mm -hmm. Now, I would say we have more questions, but you know what? Why don't we, we stop? I, I have tonight. to call Yes, yes. I say we, I we see agreed on uh, 30, tonight. 35 yes, yes. minutes. Yes. And I have a series of things to finish. Yes. Tonight. We're going to stop for tonight. I, I yeah. fully agree. So we'll continue next week. We enjoyed talking with you, Stepan, uh, Professor Asturian. Thank you so much for updating us on Artsakh this week. And to our viewers, I want to say thank you for spending your evening with us. If you'd like to hear more from Professor Asturian, he will be speaking tomorrow morning on Democracy Now! with Amy Goodman. So please tune in tomorrow. It'll be in the morning on the East Coast and it will be syndicated uh, worldwide. So you can, you can check out what time that program is going to air in your region. We have also a final announcement. Zoravik is hosting another panel discussion entitled On Ceasefires, International Inaction in the nagorno karabakh War on Monday, October 26th at 3 p.m. Eastern with Professor Asturian. David L. Phillips of Columbia's Institute for the Study of Human Rights and Dr. Lawrence Brewers of Conciliation Res Resources. Thank you for watching our Facebook live stream tonight. A recording of this installment of Artsakh Updates with Professor Asturian will be posted on facebook.com slash Zoravik. Please share the updates you received tonight with everyone you know. We'll sign off tonight, hoping for the best for nagorno karabakh for Artsakh. We will see you at our next Artsakh update. Though hopefully we won't have to do too many of these. Share party. Good night. Thanks, Lisa. Thank you.